All right. Here we go. Thank you for attending this program on the best rehab codes. My name is Dr. Marty Kotler. There's no audio taping or videotaping allowed in any unauthorized reproduction, dispensing, or forwarding of this presentation is illegal. The information in this presentation is for educational purposes. It's not intended to substitute your clinical thorough uh, evaluation of the patient. It's not legal advice. We don't provide legal services. Every attempt has been made to make certain the information in this presentation is 100% accurate. However, it's not guaranteed. Again, my name is Dr. Marty Kotler. I'll tell you a little bit about myself before we get going. I'm a chiropractor. I practiced for many years. And about 12 years ago, I started a company called Target Coding. I'm the president of the company. I'm also a certified professional compliance officer, a certified billing and coding specialist. And, you know, I, I consider myself a little unconventional because, you know, most chiropractors are not certified coders. Most certified coders are not chiropractors. So I could take this unique approach, being in practice, being in the trenches, and seeing what it's like to come up with diagnosis codes, the right ones and the wrong ones <laughs> in practice. And, um, and then I can apply some of that knowledge to the doctors that I work with to challenge them. If I have a doctor that comes up with some sort of diagnosis, I'm going to share a few of them with you today that just doesn't make sense. I can challenge the doctor and we could have a little fun and go through some exercises. So um, it's a good way to make sure the doctor is not leaving any money on the table, maximizing reimbursement. That's what I do here at Target Coding. Um, you know, some people call me the insurance guy. I don't know. I don't consider myself the insurance guy. I consider myself more of the compliance guy because that's what we specialize here at Target Coding, making sure you're compliant as it relates to five things, billing, coding, documentation, Medicare, and HIPAA. I've written many training manuals and books on billing and coding and documentation for chiropractors and physical therapists, acupuncturists, and massage therapists. I'm a contributing writer to many newspapers and magazines and journals throughout the industry like Dynamic Chiropractic, American Chiropractor, Chiropractic Economics, and for many state association newsletters. Plus, I'm a guest speaker at many state associations across the country. By the way, those of you that are part of your um, state association that's looking for a speaker, let us know. We might be able to come and speak to your group and get a sponsor so there's no money out of your pocket. All right, let's begin. Let's start off by talking about who can provide rehab services. I break it down into two groups. There are qualified healthcare professionals, also known as QHPs. That's like you, doctors, chiropractors, medical doctors, osteopaths, physical therapists, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, qualified healthcare professionals. That means you are a person that has been highly trained and you can now treat patients and report those services to insurance companies and get paid. And then we have clinical staff like CAs and nurses and nutritionists and techs and exercise physiologists and aides and certified personal trainers. These are individuals that are also trained, um, considered clinical staff, um, trained although cannot bill cannot report services to insurance companies directly and get paid. So there's a big difference. Also, the supervision. Who needs to be in the room? Who is allowed to oversee the patient? Are you allowed to do incident to billing, which we'll talk about a little bit later? So there's three types of supervision. Personal, you're in the room with the assistant, direct. You're in the office, but you don't necessarily have to be in the room. General supervision doesn't really apply to chiropractors. You have to be in the room or in the office in order for services to be billed typically. Now, here's one rule just so you could understand how this works. For Medicare, Medicare requires the physical therapist to be on site when a PTA performs the service. So that's considered direct supervision. Similar in a chiropractic practice, you have a massage therapist in room one working on a patient and you're in room two working on a patient. If you saw the patient, initially and you recommended the massage be done and now you're in the office just in case there's a problem and the massage therapist is in the other room doing the massage the bills go out with your name that's considered direct supervision and incident to billing now the state rules regarding who can provide these services can be difficult it could be hard to find sometimes you can't get a straight answer and you want to do research before you just have anyone performing services um, you want to make sure that it's okay 
you know, there are some doctors that, you know, just hire staff people and they're applying the hot packs, the traction, setting up the patient on stim, um, overseeing the exercises, and that person's not allowed to do that. You know, there are some states where CAs are not even allowed to put a hot pack on. And let me take it a little deeper. I speak to some doctors that they go, oh, yeah, I know my CAs are not allowed to, you know, um, set, you know do ultrasound, um, so I just have them do it for free. No. If it's not within your scope of practice, you can't do it even for free. You know, I hear that again. Again, let me repeat that. Oh, I have my, um, my certified chiropractic assistant um, doing the therapies, um, but we don't charge for it because we're not allowed to do it. No, if you're not allowed to do it, you can't do it at all, at all. <laughs> not, you can't just give it away for free. So make sure you check with your board, see who can perform the services. You know, you might say, oh, well, I have a, uh, you know, a college student that's really smart, that really knows a lot about exercise or maybe graduated, you know, with a master's degree in exercise physiology. Is that person okay to do the services? Probably not. You know, check with your state board. Okay, so before we get into the rehab, let's talk a little about adjustments. Chiropractic manipulation, according to the AMA, it's called CMT, Chiropractic Manipulative Treatment. It includes a little mini evaluation of the patient before the adjustment and a post adjustment, little mini evaluation. You know, some of you like to. Again, here's where my 16 years in practice can help you understand how to do things today in practice to make it simplified and organized. So if you walk into the room and you go, hi, Mrs. Jones, um, let me just do a posture check. Uh, how about we do a leg length check, you know, check forward head carriage. And then after the adjustment, you do a post adjustment evaluation, maybe retest some muscles. You can't bill extra for that. So we have five spinal regions, five extremities, and there, there are the chiropractic codes, 40, 41, 42, 43. Anybody have any questions on these? Send them in. I'll get to the questions at the end. Okay, now let's get into it. Therapeutic procedures. Okay, what are therapeutic procedures? These procedures, it's a matter of affecting change through the application of clinical skills. What did I just say? Application of clinical skills. Very important. That term you need to know. What am I talking about? Okay, so let's say you're on the witness stand. You're, you're being audited. You're, you're being sued for malpractice and you're billing for one of these rehab codes, these therapeutic procedures, and they go, uh, doctor, what clinical skills do you apply while the patient is exercising? I hope you have a good answer. We're going to get into that in a few minutes, but that's an important term there. Application of clinical skills. If you're billing insurance, then um, they may want to know what skills you're applying. If you're not applying any skills, if you're just watching the patient ride a stationary bicycle, there's no skills being applied, then the health plans go, it's not a billable service. So. One-on-one -on -one patient contact is required. One or more areas each 15 minutes. Hmm. What does that mean? We're going to go over that. All right. First one here, 97110, therapeutic exercises. Write down this acronym, SERF, S-E-R-F. Therapeutic exercises are used to develop strength, endurance, range of motion, and flexibility. There's your acronym. S stands for strength. E stands for endurance. R stands for range of motion. F stands for flexibility. So those of you listening to this presentation, if you are billing 97110, and most of you are, your notes better show that the patient has what? First of all, if you're trying to improve, let's say, range of motion, what should, what should your notes say the patient has a lack of when they come in? Right, range of motion. And what should your exam show? Decrease range of motion. See, this is where some doctors get in trouble or have to give money back. Billing 97110, getting paid, everything's great, right? A lot of doctors and staff members think if we get paid, that means everything is okay. Mm, sometimes not. What do I mean by that? You bill 97110, you get paid, you think everything's okay, then a health plan, a malpractice company asks you for your notes, and your notes show 
range of motion, normal, reflexes, normal, muscle strength, normal, everything's normal. That's where the insurance companies go, ah, give us the money back. There's no medical necessity to do therapeutic exercises if everything's normal. It's an active procedure. The patient must be doing the work. A lot of doctors are billing this incorrectly because they're, they, they're just sitting back watching the patient exercise or, uh, I'm sorry, they are assisting the patient. You could sit back and watch a patient exercise, but the patient has to be doing the work. You're not supposed to be doing the work. It's an active procedure. What you see on your screen, these are all active procedures. The patient is bending, lifting, they're carrying weights, tubes, balls, bands. If you're thinking about, I know some of you listening to this, you've just been doing chiropractic adjustments and maybe a little traction. And now you're thinking about expanding and adding another code. Maybe you're thinking about 97110, but you don't know how to do it. You don't know where to start. Contact foot levelers, get one of these Nexus or Baxis, attach it to the wall, and you could be up and running in 15 minutes with a low-tech rehab department. <clears throat> When I first started billing 97110, I didn't even have any equipment. I had patients lying on the floor on a gym mat, or I just had them stay on my chiropractic table. They were doing abdominal crunches, knee to chest exercises, all the different exercises. So it's an active procedure. Next, 97112. What's this? Neuromuscular re-education of movement, balance, coordination, kinesthetic sense, posture, proprioception. Seems like a perfect code for chiropractors to bill. Well, some insurance companies have a problem with it, but let's go over the basics. Neuromuscular re-education is used to improve balance, coordination. So if I'm looking at your notes and you're billing 97112, the first thing that I would look for if I was assisting you with a, a self-review or an audit, or if an insurance company was looking at your notes, one of the first things they're going to look for to see, does the patient have a problem with Movement, balance, coordination, posture, proprioception. And what are you doing? The patient needs to be doing something like you see on the screen, all those photos, on a wobble board, one leg standing, trying to improve proprioception. Some insurance companies consider this non-payable because they think the patient has to have some sort of advanced neuromuscular disorder like multiple sclerosis. I disagree with that. However, I'm not paying your bills. Um, if an insurance company just flat out says we don't pay for this unless the patient has some sort of advanced degenerative condition going on, then guess what? Don't use this code. Next, 97140. 97140 is manual therapy techniques, which includes one or more of the following. Soft tissue mobilization, myofascial release, manual lymphatic drainage, joint mobilization, manual traction. This is a passive service. The patient ain't doing anything but lying there, right? The first two codes I went over, the patient has to be doing the service. Again, 110 and 112 are active procedures, not passive. 97140 is a passive procedure. You see the photos here? The patient is just sitting there or lying there doing nothing. That's considered passive. So for this type of service, you cannot bill 110 or 112. This is 97140, a lot of doctors use, a lot of doctors will have staff members, like a licensed massage therapist do the manual therapy. Patients love getting soft tissue. You know, I work with um, quite a few doctors that take care of uh, professional athletes. Professional athletes, at least my experience, is they don't get five minute chiropractic adjustments. The doctors that I know that work with professional athletes and celebrities, they're spending one and a half to two hours with the patient. I have a client, he goes to, uh, he goes on tour with some of the, you know, well-known rock and roll bands. Uh, when he treats them, he's with them with, for one and a half to two hours, each patient, each session. So what's going on? It doesn't take that long to do an adjustment. A lot of soft tissue work is being done. Now, one of the problems with this code is there's a CCI edit on it, which means you're not supposed to do it in the same exact region as the chiropractic adjustment. So if you do it in a separate region, that's why you use modifier 59. 
we're not going to get into modifier 59 because I could probably spend um, three hours just talking about modifier 59. So that go to our YouTube channel. I just did a webinar, uh, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, um, on uh, modifiers. And I spent quite a bit of time on 59, so you can go check that out. But again, this is a passive therapy. Next, 97530, therapeutic activities. Hmm. Big question here is Dr. Kotler. We get this question almost every day at Target Coding Help Desk. What's the difference between 530 and 110? Well, right off the bat, the, the definition. 110 is exercises, 530 is activities. So you have to start creating that little breadcrumb trail. Here comes Mrs. Jones. She's got back pain. You should be asking her, how does your back pain, Mrs. Jones, what does your back pain prevent you from doing? Oh, well, I have trouble lifting my daughter. Um, this is a patient. This patient is a, you know, 26-year-old female. She's, got a, she's a young mom, and she wants to lift her children up off the floor, and she can't. So she has a problem with lifting. Emphasize that, and then do exercises to help lifting or carrying or twisting. That's why a lot of people call this the ING code, because whatever you're doing, whatever the patient is doing, has to relate to an activity. That's not the case with therapeutic exercises. Therapeutic exercises, you're just going to perform one of those SERF with this. It's a multi-parameter code. need to relate it to an activity. It pays more because you have to do more. Let us know if you have any questions on it. But it's totally different than 110. Here's another nice one, 97535. This is done just once or twice. The other codes that I mentioned prior to this one, you can do three times a week. This is done sparingly. It's to show patients how to do things at home, self-care, home management training, how to bend, how to lift, how to exercise at home, how to rake leaves, shovel snow, sit at a computer, get in and out of a car, in and out of bed. The patient is doing it. You're sitting back watching them. You demonstrate, and then they show you. This is an excellent code. Most health plans pay for it. Now, with some of these rehab codes, you may need to use the GP modifier. It's actually a Medicare modifier. If for some reason your claims are not getting through to the secondary, it's probably because you're not using the GP modifier on your therapy codes, your rehab codes. This is a... Medicare modifier, which means the service was done by a physical therapist. So you may be thinking, hey, I ain't a physical therapist. I'm a chiropractor. I don't want to use this code. I'm sorry, this modifier. Well, if you don't use it and you're getting denied, it's probably because the health plan requires it, even though you're not a physical therapist. So with... Um, Medicare, this is what I recommend you do on your rehab codes and your modalities. There's electrical stim, GPGY, there's your 97140. Just make sure you're using modifier 59 properly and you're not over-utilizing it. I know three doctors right now I am assisting with audits. Their billing companies just added the 59 modifier to all the codes because they thought, oh, that's how you get paid better. That's an inexperienced billing company careful with the 59. Don't overutilize it. Now with these rehab codes, they're all time-based. So my recommendation is you follow total time. There's two different schools of thought. There's total time and rule of eight is what I call it. I recommend you follow total time unless you hear differently. Now I know my clients in Minnesota are going, hey Marty, you know it's different here. Yes, in Minnesota there are some health plans that will use the rule of eight, but in general, I think you should follow total time. So one unit is 8 to 22 minutes. But here's a little trick. Look at the top left corner. If you do 23 minutes of 1 for 0, oh, your initial reaction would be, oh, I could build two units for that because I got to the 23rd minute. Then you follow it with 1 1 0 oh, for another 23 minutes. Your initial reaction is, oh, I could build that for two units also. No, you can't. <clears throat> What's the total? 46. 46 is three units. If you get to 53, then you could bill for four units. Rule of eight's different. Do eight minutes of 140 and then eight minutes of 110 
for a total of 16 minutes. There are a few health plans that will pay both codes, but if you build United Healthcare for two codes for 16 minutes, two units, uh, and you got paid, you'd have to give the money back. Now, when it comes to justifying the diagnosis codes that pair with your CPT codes, that could be a challenge for some doctors. So ICD-10 codes need to match with your CPT codes. You know, I look at like food and wine. You ever go to a food and wine festival where there are experts at these events that educate you to pair food and wine? Well, I am going to um, show you how to pair your procedure codes and your diagnosis codes right now. So let's start with a diagnosis of sacroiliac sprain or sacroiliac uh, subluxation. So that pairs with certain codes. But before you pair it with a CPT code, you need to justify the use of it. So how do you, let's say you're on the witness stand, Dr. Kotler, you diagnosed the patient with a sacroiliac sprain. How did you come up with that? I hope you say something like this. Well, the patient had pain in the SI joints. I did Yeoman's, Ganslin's. There you go. Yeoman's and Ganslin's. You remember those orthopedic tests from chiropractic college? Do You better do those if you're diagnosing a patient with an SI joint problem. This is how you justify the, the diagnosis codes you're using. Oh, what about radiculopathy? Any of you use radiculopathy diagnosis codes? They're excellent codes. Cervical radiculopathy is so common and pairs nicely with something like mechanical traction. That would be a beautiful, you know, pairing right there. So cervical, let's say you diagnose a patient with cervical radiculopathy. Now, I don't know, let's say you are dealing with a managed care plan and now you're on the phone with a case manager. They go, hey, Dr. Kotler, how'd you come up with cervical radiculopathy? I hope you have a good answer. Well, the patient had pain in the neck. It was radiating into the arm. I did a little Jackson compression, cervical distraction, maybe spurling. I checked for any uh, type of uh, diminished reflexes and myotomal weakness. There was limited motion. Hmm. There you go. That'll make your life so much easier. Oh, this is a page out of a book that I, um, um, this, this book has a whole bunch of diagnosis codes. I think about 25 diagnosis codes, and it provides you with the ortho, neuro, and chiro test to help support it, to substantiate it. You know, something simple as sprain, strain, how do you diagnose that? How do you, you know, how do you support that? How do you justify that? Cervical brachial syndrome, yeah, Wright's, Atsons, remember those from chiropractic college? Okay, now let's talk a little bit about modalities. I have a few minutes. Modalities. We have supervised modalities. They don't require one-on-one -on -one contact. They're not time-based. The top three are the most common, hot, cold, traction, and unattended stim. So you don't have to stay in the room. They're not time-based. You could, you could leave these on for five minutes or five hours. You could only build one unit. And then we have constant attendance modalities. The most common one here is ultrasound. This does require one-on-one -on -one contact. By the way, those of you that, are, that have been billing 64550, that code's been deleted. As of January 1st, that code has been deleted. Now, let's say you're billing your rehab codes, and then you get a denial from an insurance company. Oh, the services were not medically necessary. Don't just give up there. Find out why. You're entitled to know. If you get denied for whatever service you render, comes back, denied, not medically necessary, you deserve to know. Was it because the notes didn't show enough improvement? You didn't use the modifier right? Your procedures are not showing to be effective. Your goals have not been reached. It looks like the notes um, appear to look like it's wellness maintenance, or maybe they're not legible, or maybe there's no signature. I've seen some health plans deny services stating it's not medically necessary. The reason, there was no signature. That doesn't make sense. That's ridiculous. So when it comes to rehab codes, focus on showing improvement. Another little helpful tip. You're billing rehab codes, 
and now it goes towards the deductible. So deductibles, you must make attempts to collect deductibles and co-pays and co-insurance. A lot of staff members, especially new staff members, when we train new staff members, we hear this a lot. Oh, we don't collect anything from patients. Oh, uh, Sheila, why don't you collect anything? Mm, th that's what uh, we were trained. Don't ask the patient for any money. You know, we accept the insurance as full payment. Um, well, the insurance doesn't pay, so we don't even have the patient pay anything. The patient just comes in for free. Or, you know, we don't charge our Medicare patients um, for exams because Medicare doesn't pay for exams, right? These are the things we hear. So just make sure you're collecting deductibles, co-pays. If not, you know, you could have some problems. This is a letter a doctor got. It said the per this is from Medicare. The purpose of this letter is to educate you that our office received a complaint alleging you knowingly process Medicare claims as if the patient is paying their co-pays but they're not. <laughs> it's not a fun letter to get. Here's another one from Cigna. Cigna said uh, to a doctor, we want to see your records. Please include copies of patient and billing collection ledgers, documents that show when the bills were sent to the patient and how much money has been paid by the patients. Here's another one. Uh, after contacting some, dear doctor, after contacting some of your patients, it has come to our attention that you routinely waive all patient responsibility. Ooh. That hurts. Here's another one. Um, so, oh, what about this? Denied. Um, payment will be considered. So you bill a rehab code like 110 or 112, and then you get a letter. Mm, we're not paying. We want to see the notes. Oh, wait. Is this a prepayment audit? Could be a problem. This doctor here, this is a letter. Doctor um, is on a prepayment audit. Why? They did a little research, and they found out. No signatures, no assessments, it's right in the middle here, no plan of care. The testing did not change the plan of care. Some member treatments indicates years of the same treatment without improvement. Wow, a lot going on there. Here's another, this is Anthem. It's from coast to coast. The first one was New York, this one's from California. This doctor's being put on a prepayment audit because of his incorrect billing of 97110. It said 97110. The records we reviewed did not contain a treatment plan. The records did not state how the therapeutic exercises were performed, the start and stop times, or how the exercises were tolerated by the patient. That's something I always talk about when I do my risk management and medical errors seminars. You should be commenting, did the patient tolerate the treatment well? After every visit, I recommend you write down patient tolerated the treatment well and the treatment was without incident, assuming that's applicable. Oh, back to code pairing, yeah. See here, um, cervical radiculopathy pairs beautifully with mechanical traction. How about shoulder stiffness? That pairs fantastic with therapeutic exercises. You know, I consider myself a coding sommelier. You ever hear that word, sommelier? That's a... I think it's a French word for a wine and food pairing expert, a master. If you ever go to a wine and food festival or a fancy restaurant, they might have this person come over, talk to you about the wine because they want to pair your food. I find it fascinating. I like listening to these people educate me on how to pair food and wine to have a nice experience. Well. I'm a coding sommelier. I will show you how to pair your CPD codes and your diagnosis codes. For example, patient has myalgia of the neck muscles or myofascial pain in the neck. Pairs beautifully with 140. All right, let me just close with a few. Uh, yeah, I have the, my little nine step action plan. First step is get proactive. Every time I deal with a doctor that's been audited, investigated. They always say, oh, wow, I wish I would have done things differently. Get proactive. Don't wait for the oil light to flash on your dashboard. Get out of the car, open up the hood, check the oil. Most of the doctors I work with, 80% of the doctors we work with here at Target Coding are proactive. They contact us to prevent problems, yeah, it's nice. 20% aren't 
are in a crisis. They're being audited. They've been asked for money back. They've been on a prepayment audit. And those doctors always say, oh, wish I could have done things differently. Step two, this is for staff members. When a new patient comes in, you better make sure they fill out all the paperwork. You don't get forms signed. You don't get it done right, staff members. It can come back to haunt you. I've seen it happen. Step three, doctors, that's for you. Review all the new patient paperwork before you even go into the room. Take a look. Maybe the patient checked something on the review of systems that, you know, they're vomiting blood or something, and you didn't catch it. You didn't see it. You didn't discuss it with the patient. It could be a problem down the road. Just review all the paperwork. Step four, review the policies from the insurance companies you bill the most. Step five, understand what and why. Your CPT codes are what you're doing, and your diagnosis codes are why you're doing them. They have to pair. They have to match. If you're doing, uh, if you're billing for 110 and you don't show any range of motion deficits, you see, you're not matching, you're not pairing properly. Six, do a self-test on your soap notes. Step seven, always keep learning. Attend seminars, webinars on a regular basis. You should always keep learning how to help more patients, how to improve your business, how to become more profitable. Step eight. Put together a simple billing and coding policy manual. Explain what you do and why you do it. Some of you adjust full spine, right? A patient comes in. Here comes Mrs. Jones. All she has is neck pain. That's all. But you're adjusting her thoracics, her lumbars, maybe her pelvis and her knee. It's great. Your notes show adjusted cervical, thoracic, lumbar, pelvis, knee, and you only bill 98940. Do you see how that could look strange? to a health plan, they could think you're downcoding, something looks weird, so you need to have a policy as to why you do that. That's part of our policy manual that we help doctors put together. And step nine, conduct regular meetings, document them, put them in a log, have meetings with your billing staff, especially with the insurance companies that pay you the most. Here's my little 35% rule. If you're collecting 35%, or more from one particular health plan, do a deep dive into that company's policies and procedures and how you bill them. <clears throat> Make sure you're doing it right. I have a doctor I work with right now. Last year he collected $700,000 from Cigna just from one health plan. He collected $700,000. So I've been working with him for a while. Every year we go into his office. He has a policy and procedure manual. And guess what? He still gets audited, but he doesn't really have problems. Yeah, sometimes they'll audit him and he'll have to give back $1,000 or $500 or $2,500 and sometimes nothing. You know, they're watching him. He's the big fish in the little pond. They think something's weird because he's collecting so much. There's nothing weird going on. He's a hardworking doctor that has a lot of passion about growing his business. He also stays in his office till 11 o'clock <laughs> a lot of nights, but he ain't doing anything wrong. All right, just a few closing comments. Check with all the plans you bill prior to submitting claims. Make sure it's compliant. I want to thank everybody for attending. Here's our contact information. There's my email. You can email me directly. You want to set up a free consultation with me? Email us. You have questions you're not sure about some of the things I said? Now, if you're a member of Target Coding, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to uh, um, email us. Just uh, contact Natasha. We'll take care of that. If you're not a member, set up a free consultation. Maybe you have just general questions about other things than uh, rehab. You can call me. We can chat. Pick my brain for 15 minutes, and then we're done. You don't have to use my services. If I find something that I think I can help you with, you still have an option to either ask me to help you fix it or do it on your own. No charge. All right, we're going to get to questions and answers in a couple of minutes. Um, just to tell you a little bit about what we do besides these webinars here at Target Coding. We, we sell products, we sell videos, and books, and forms. We do on-site trainings, and we have memberships. We customize HIPAA and Medicare compliance programs for practices. 
here's the book that I was referring to earlier. Remember I was talking about a book that has a whole bunch of diagnosis codes and the ortho neuro chiro test to support it? This is it. It's called the book on the best chiropractic ICD-10 and CBD codes to improve reimbursement. And there's a whole bunch. Now, besides these diagnosis codes, there's great FAQs. You could be in practice for 30 years. You still might not know the difference between effusion, swelling, and edema. You could be in practice for 25 years and not know the difference between disc disorders and disc displacement or between spasm and contracture, between idiopathic scoliosis and thoracic, thoracogenic scoliosis. What's the difference between myalgia, myositis, and myofasciitis? What's the difference between radiculopathy and myelopathy, right? These are the things you may be curious to know. There's a whole nice FAQ section. How about, also in the book is, how about knowing which codes pay for the most visits? They're called long-term treatment diagnosis codes. That's in the book. Pairing your codes. Mention that. You're billing 97110. What are the best diagnosis codes to pair with 110? It's in the book. Cheat sheets. At a quick glance, we have a whole bunch of cheat sheets for regular patients and for PI patients. Oh, we also sell forms. We have a great forms packet just updated for this year. Excellent, terrific forms. We break them down into certain categories like new patient forms, financial and admin forms, exams and treatment plans. Have a whole bunch of different types of sample soap notes. You can copy and paste these into ChiroTouch and all your software. This is um, these are just basic, simple forms. You could have the best software in the world. ChiroTouch, Acom, Eclipse, Genesis. There's a lot of good software programs out there. You still need forms. You still need letters of medical necessity to fight back. I have a whole bunch of those here. Fight back letters. You ever get denied for an adjustment and manual therapy on the same day? We have one of the best letters in the industry. Overturns that appeal 87% of the time. I threw in a few physical therapy forms, acupuncture forms, Medicare ABN forms. A whole bunch of HIPAA forms are included in this package. So, again, we could email them to you in Microsoft Word. At the top, it says Main Street Health and Wellness. Get rid of that. Put your name in on the top of every form. We also have something called our Smart Choice Program. You want me to analyze your practice or one of my coding professionals? We'll do a complete checkup, and we'll tell you what we like, what we don't like. It takes about three weeks to go through the program, and then you're on your own. We'll tell you if you're proving, um, if you're justifying medical necessity. We'll let you know if your cash plans are compliant. We'll let you know if you're underbilling. We'll let you know if you're using modifiers properly or improperly. We'll let you know if you're leaving money on the table. If you see Medicare patients, Medicare says you should have, should have. They strongly recommend you have a billing and coding Medicare compliance manual based on the OIG guidelines. We have that if you'd like. We can do that with you. If you don't want us to do it with you, do it on your own. Find someone else. Put together a billing and coding policy manual. HIPAA is mandatory. HIPAA is required. HIPAA is a federal law. HIPAA is not optional. You must incorporate a HIPAA compliance program and that doesn't mean um, you know talking quietly and having the patient sign a HIPAA notice. That doesn't make you HIPAA compliant. Security risk assessment, written policies and procedures, training staff, we have a concierge premier HIPAA compliance program. If you're shopping around for HIPAA compliance program, make sure you compare app, uh, apples to apples. Hondas are terrific cars. We love Hondas, but we don't sell Hondas. We sell Mercedes, BMWs, and Ferraris here at Target Coding because we do most of the heavy lifting for you. If you have a Honda that needs a repair, they don't typically give you a loaner car. We sell Lexus. You come in, you need your Lexus uh, oil changed, you could have a loaner car. So we just go above and beyond. We charge more because you get more. So make sure you shop around. If you're looking for a HIPAA compliance program, we do most of the work for you. 
everything's cloud-based, and we send you everything on paper. So you have both, hard copy and digital. We have memberships, terrific. We have three different levels, basic, gold, silver. Come on, join us. We're helping so many doctors. We have hundreds of doctors across the country. We help, you need testimonials, you need references, let us know. Now you might say, Dr. Kotler, we don't see Medicare patients. Okay, so we can still put together a nice, simple billing and coding compliance manual. For what? You see a lot of Blue Cross Blue Shield patients? Let's do one that's designed specifically just in case Blue Cross Blue Shield knocks on your door. You show them a billing and coding policy on how you do things and why you do them. Ah, oh, that'll be such a wonderful feeling on your part. Acupuncture billing and coding? Yes. Working with an acupuncturist right now, being asked back for $600,000 doing a lot of things wrong and he admits it soon as I came on board I put together a compliance plan specifically for an acupuncturist on billing and coding put that together I gave it to the attorney the attorney went wow this is great showed it to the insurance company the insurance company reduced the fee down to two hundred thousand dollars this one billing and coding policy manual all of a sudden, the negotiations went down two-thirds. I'm not saying that'll happen with you. It, you know, The insurance company was just impressed that the doctor took the action step. See, I'm working with another doctor right now who's being audited. The audit started four months ago. When he started looking into it, he went, hmm, yeah, I guess the insurance company's right. We're not doing things properly. We need to improve. That was four months ago. He hasn't done anything in four months. Now, if the insurance company comes back and says, hey, we want to see more notes, this office looks like the, one of the bad guys. Didn't do anything. If you get a request for records, if you get audited, and you think you need to improve a couple of things, do it right away. So just in case, they come back and go, hey, have you done anything to fix what's going on? If you say yes, they'll leave you alone. If you say no, they'll come back and ask for more money. We have 11 videos that we sell. They're all new and fresh and updated. 11 videos, three different prices, and then there's our book and uh, our forms. So I want to again thank everybody for attending. Um, I hope you learned a lot. Let's go take a look and see what questions have come in.